quick show of hands, how many people here have heard of code.org, used code.org? OK, nice smattering. Uh, and show of hands, how many of you have ever used or you know, like investigated a test framework like Selenium or uh, PhantomJS? OK, nice. All right, we're in good company today. Uh, yeah, so I'll be talking about uh, our journey starting to visually test stuff at code.org. Uh, but before that, for a couple reasons, I wanted to just uh, quickly tell a little story about how I got started with stuff. Uh, this is me and my three brothers, four boys, my poor mom. She was always hoping for a girl. Uh, if you can guess which one I am, hard to tell. <laughs> Left, right. I'm the one on the way right. I'm the youngest. I was the last straw for my mom. So when she gave up, she's very happy now that now we have, uh, now she has daughters-in-law. So I think that made up for it. Uh, so this was me. Uh, we were fortunate enough for, for two reasons when we were younger uh, to be exposed to computer programming. Uh, on the one hand, we had access to computers when we were younger. My dad started out his career doing programming software work, so we had computers around. There's some super old computer looking there. I think I only used to play games on it, some DOS games. Does anyone recognize this, this browser? <laughs> fortunately or unfortunately? Uh, fortunately for me, uh, when I was probably, I don't know, 10 or 11 or 12, uh, I noticed there was this button on the browser that said edit. Like, I don't, I don't know if any other browsers I've seen since then had an edit button. I'd never done any programming. I didn't know you could make a web page. I saw the edit button. I clicked it. Well, actually, I was afraid to click it because I was on some big website like NewYorkTimes.com or Wired or something, and I was like, if I edit it, is it am I going to get in trouble? <laughs> like, I, was, I was pretty sure that if I edited the page and click save, it would change the website, which was both exciting and terrifying. Uh, I clicked it anyway, made the change, and then I refreshed it and it was gone, so I was upset. <laughs> so I got more and more into, into uh, making web pages. My brothers, having older brothers who had like gotten into some tech stuff before was very helpful and they would show me how to style stuff up better than the Netscape editor lets you do and started learning HTML and a little bit of CSS. This was the extent of the CSS uh, so this is a web page I made for a sport fishing charter company that I met on an AOL chat room who <laughs> would pay me $20 to make a, uh, a web page, which was probably a good deal for them. Uh, <laughs> you'll notice I was uh, getting pretty into the Photoshop, uh, the layer filter effects, uh, and, the, oh, and also, of course, the nice table-based layout. I kind of missed that, but it sounds like we're getting back to the ease of that now with the with the box model and everything. So yeah, this was my first CSS. Uh, and it was probably a snippet I copied. I copied and then changed some stuff out. You'll notice the mismatched capitalizations of the style tags. I was never sure whether it's supposed to be all caps or not. Uh, <laughs> some, nice, uh, some nice weird semicolon usage. So anyway, the point of, the point of telling you all this, uh, then when I was sitting down to, to make an AIM as, you know, it was very popular back in the day. You had to have an AIM uh, username. I was trying different names. I tried Brian Jordan, it's taken. I tried, oh, this thing is taken. I love turtles. I was like obsessed with turtles. I think I wrote some report about turtles. So I tried like turtle, taken. Turtle man, <laughs> taken. And then I thought, what if I add that cool magic language I don't know how to use yet, CSS. So that was my AIM username, was turtle CSS. I'm just telling that story to say that I'm really excited to be here at CSSCon. <laughs> it's kind of cool. Turtle CSS finally made it. I'm really, it's just super cool knowing that, like, if, if I had known back then that there would be an entire room of people who knew about CSS and that I would even know a little more CSS, I'd be like, what? Uh, so anyway, back to, back to uh, the, the talk thing. <laughs> um, this is me and my brothers. Ultimately, we all ended up taking different paths and ended up all now doing programming. Uh, and it was, it just makes me think, I, th I think now and then like, geez, what a weird like series of coincidences or just like luck or privilege to have, to be able to have access to the computers and to be able to uh, learn to program. Like none of our schools had any computer science classes the entire time. 
uh, you know, people who also had computers just never, never ended up having the opportunity to learn to program. That brings me to, oh yes, and I wanted to uh, plug a talk, Alicia's talk uh, tomorrow at the end of the day. I think will be a deeper dive into uh, the, those sorts of efforts and what you can do uh, to help that out. So what I do, and actually those two other brothers of mine also now work with me at code.org, which is funny. I wouldn't recommend working with your siblings. No, it's okay sometimes. Uh, <laughs> Code.org, we're a nonprofit. Uh, it's based in Seattle. Uh, the goal of Code.org is to expand particip participation in computer science. So we actually think that the best way to expand the, the participation in computer science is to bring computer science classes into schools and be taught next to algebra, geometry uh, in K through 12. So the way we, there's a few ways we do that. There are a lot of missing pieces of the puzzle when it started in 2013. Um, computer science wasn't seen as something anyone could do. Computer science wasn't, uh, wasn't there weren't great curricula available for K through 12 yet. Teachers hadn't, didn't have the expertise to teach computer science or feel confident with that yet. Uh, so we've kind of, and, and also state, there's a lot of problems. <laughs> States also didn't count computer science as a credit. Uh, so we've kind of been attacking it from every angle. Um, one of the things that we did was we ran the Hour of Code, uh, which is a yearly event which, which says, hey, teachers and students, why don't you run one hour of code with your students? Uh, it's, you know, a little bite-sized chunk, and it's a puzzle-based puzzle -based games that students can play, and they learn stuff like sequencing and loops and um, just, yeah, event handling and, and some basic concepts using drag-and-drop blocks to start for the, for the younger ages. There's a little video that kind of shows, it'll be, it's a quick one, shows kind of like the other pieces of what we do. Uh, there's so many pieces, or uh, so many different pieces going on with it. So this kind of gives a nice overview of the teacher trainings, all that sort of stuff. So yeah, the funny thing is a lot of people haven't a lot of people haven't heard of code.org, but it's it's actually getting into a lot of schools. Like, if you ask, if you have nieces, nephews, sons, daughters, you can ask actually them, and they might ha actually already be doing computer science in their school, uh, or their district might be planning on doing it. Most people have just heard of the Hour of Code, though. <laughs> That's the name. So this will give you an idea of what we're going to be testing. So students used our tools to make these apps. They can make little games, fun little stuff. Even fruit keyboards. <laughs> it's pretty sweet. <laughs> 40,000 teachers have been trained. Those are some of the teachers having completed the training. And we have a bunch of school districts, a lot of the largest school districts, inner city school districts have signed on to basically implement computer science across their whole uh, their whole district, K through 12, which is pretty sweet. So 75% of schools still don't cover computer science. All right. So let's talk about how to test this. And I'll talk about if, if you're interested in uh, volunteering. We're all open source and that sort of stuff at the end. Uh, so yeah, we're working on full, full curriculum, district partnerships, professional development, policy change. Fortunately, I don't have to do all of that. Uh, I only work on our K through 12 CS curriculum, and that's what we'll be focusing on testing today. Uh, so anyway, teacher trade teachers are coming trained. That must be old, because I think it was 40K. Uh, a lot of people using this stuff. Uh, the cool thing is that because we're in schools and during the school day, we have a student population that reflects real population. Uh, it's not just people who you know, have computers at home or can make, make it to an after school program. Uh, it's actually in the school day. So that's very cool. So how did code.org start automated testing? How might you start automated testing? Uh, so in 2013 to 2014, 2013 was the first hour of code. It was a very, uh, you know, last minute sort of thing, like, oh, let's put together a tutorial. I was not there at that point. I joined in 
early 2014. Uh, but you know, as you imagine, when you create a new thing very quickly uh, and push it out to production uh, to a lot of people, the the there is bugs that come up, uh, and as we'll see, we use a lot of kind of bleeding, well, not bleeding edge, but bleeding edge for school computers, technologies uh, in our tutorials. Uh, so yeah, there wasn't really so much testing. So why would we test? Why would we invest the time to, and yeah, the time and infrastructure to actually set up automated tests? Uh, I, I think that automated tests aren't necessarily for every for every team, or you know, the the full like cross-browser automated tests, I think you want to think about what what are the what are the use cases for it. What are the things that break, and how bad is it when things break? In our case, it's pretty bad when things break. We're not doing we're not doing financial stuff, but uh, think about it. We're 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 in schools. This stuff's being used day to day in schools. Uh, you got teachers who, I don't, yeah, I don't know if you've uh, ever like been in a classroom, it's kind of pandemonium. We'll go in, the teachers will, teacher will come in, get the kids all set up on the computers, takes like five, 10 minutes, you know, oh, I gotta log in, press the login button, teacher, they raise their hand, then you gotta go over to them. It's kind of, uh, it's pretty stressful. Uh, when on top of that, they say, teacher, the level's not going forward, or this page isn't loading, uh, it's, it makes everything way worse, and it's super stressful. <laughs> it's, I've, I've seen that in classrooms before. Very rare, of course, now. Uh, and of course, schools, if you remember schools. Uh, schools have <laughs> quite a wide array of situations. I remember, <laughs> yeah, I, I9, we got Chromebooks, iPads, and a mix of everything. Uh, I remember this one, this one issue, we were doing the Minecraft Hour of Code last year. It was like a, a little uh, tutorial where uh, it's kind of like a 2D, like grid-based Minecraft, and you like program Steve to, or Alex to move around. Uh, I got this bug report. It was like two days before the Hour of Code. Like millions and millions of students and teachers are about to use it in their classroom. And we get a support request saying, whenever, whenever we go to the Minecraft Hour of Code page, the browser closes. I was like, the browser closes? Oh my god, that's the nightmare. I was, I was on the hook for that in a day, millions and millions of people are gonna maybe, I don't know, have their browser closed. So I needed to figure this out. So uh, I was like, I was testing it on every browser. Uh, they weren't very specific in their first request. I think they said, may have said Chrome. Uh, and they just said like, and I was like, is it is it just Minecraft? Is it the other tutorials? Because we we're using a, a new JavaScript game engine. Phaser, very cool game engine. I didn't know what might have what might have been wrong. So I emailed some diagnostic stuff. Can you try a different browser? Can you try these other pages? Different tutorial. And I was just so confused. The the Minecraft Hour of Code page would close in every browser, multiple browsers, and not the other tutorial pages. So. <laughs> Finally, I, it dawned on me, I think it was like the night before the Hour of Code, and I'm like, I'm having nightmares about this. Uh, I email him and I say, can you try going to Minecraft.net, the main Minecraft web page? And he's like, oh yeah, that closed too. So I guess the school had a filter <laughs> set up that sits there and closes the web page if the page says Minecraft on it, anywhere on the page. <laughs> so I said, yeah, there wasn't much we could do to excise every mention of the word Minecraft in our source, so good luck. Maybe try a different, uh, ask the IT department about that one. So yeah, weird stuff happens. Also, we support a lot of languages, like 40 plus languages, including right to left mode, which we take to kind of an extreme where we actually flip uh, the entire layout of the page over, so the run button's on the right, still towards the visualization area, and then the blocks the uh, drag and drop blocks can expand out that way. Oh, and yes, as I alluded to earlier, bleeding ish edge technologies such as Canvas and SVG, which are now not so bleeding edge, but uh, turns out there are a lot of bugs you can find in a bunch of different browsers in those that uh, you'll discover when a lot of kids are clicking around and dragging stuff using it. Uh, so this is this is our so yeah that see right here. Yeah, you can see like the drag and drop blocks, students drag and drop blocks out to, to program that and think now, like how would you test that? How would you make a, make a robot, sweet testing robot, drag those things around? Because we'll, we'll be getting to that. This is, this is called App Lab. Uh, it's our IDE. 
I love it for creative programming, actually, uh, where you can drag out interface elements, write that stuff, uh, and then create JavaScript events. So this is, this is for our late middle school to early high school. Uh, so they start out just doing drag and drop blocks in the earlier grades, and then later on move on to this. And that actually you can, tra you can transition from blocks to text there. Uh, so you can you kind of get the goodness of self-documenting blocks, and then you can transfer to text. How would we test that? So many things to test. Let's get started. So yeah, it's kind of daunting sometimes thinking about how do we actually how would we actually get started testing at our you know on my project or at our company because it's like what do I like invest like a month and you know say like okay we're going to do this thing. Uh, we started very small. Uh, the founder of Code.org. Uh, he had he he works with a bunch of companies and advises companies, and they had said that they would uh, they had said like hey you guys are having all these cross browser issues you should check out this cross browser testing I knew nothing about it my teammates knew nothing about it uh, one of our engineers Brendan set up uh, just our first little test and it was uh, just hitting a few browsers go to a page uh, and then and then we started running that uh, so how are our tests actually organized and run uh, and when Brendan first implemented it. Uh, we had it use uh, Selenium WebDriver, uh, which is Selenium is the uh, kind of lingua franca of of uh, browser telling browsers what to do, uh, and we use Cucumber as kind of a high level, higher level language like DSL language where you define your own steps uh, to just kind of make little reusable snippets of steps. Uh, as as I learned, there are other patterns for doing this, like the page object pattern, which is like I've I've gotten called out for not using that. Before, but uh, this works and it's it's kind of cool. So yeah, we have uh, features. It's a, our big list of all the uh, tests that we have. Uh, step definitions where it's like, okay, if, if they say click on this, what does that mean in the code? So like, on use the browser object, do that thing. Uh, so this is what one of our tests looks like. Uh, so you're if you basically say, given I'm on this web page, so go to this web page. And if you're running on a, a different host, it'll point it to a different subdomain. And I rotate to landscape, so we're also testing on iPad simulators. And some of the br browser providers actually have real device testing, which we have not explored, but that is interesting for native stuff. Uh, you wait to see a dialog, and then you close it, and then that element should be there. And then eventually we actually drag blocks to blocks, press the run button, et cetera. And a bad habit of ours is uh, we often make cucumber steps that are uh, that let you just say selectors and stuff, and apparently you're not supposed to put selectors in your cucumber uh, text either, but it works. Uh, so the takeaways from uh, doing that stuff, uh, yeah, so building up a library of steps is actually pretty useful uh, because you're building up very reusable pieces, especially if you have some JavaScript you gotta trigger on the page, or if you have some assertion you wanna make about uh, you know, some, some thing, you can build up reusable steps with cucumber. Uh, so in this case, we have something that lets you drag block A to block B, uh, and then, so now in your step, all you gotta write is that. You don't have to reference any JavaScript or know too much about the stuff underlying it. The other lesson we learned was, hey, don't test on real production data because then that's gonna change because we have our education team is going through and editing levels, adding levels, changing the order of things. Uh, so set up test, step separate test data if you can. Um, even better to have it programmatically set up. In our case, we just ha we use our own level editing pipeline to just set up a test only levels, uh, which is kind of a smattering of levels of different stuff on our entire site. Um, also, a handy page to use if you're if you do want to do some manual testing. It's like oh, here's everything on our page. So actually, something that would be useful if you have like a style guide, a you know a set of patterns that your team uses uh, for visual stuff. Uh, well, I guess we'll get to visual testing in a second, but I think that's a good target maybe for something to uh, point your tests at. Other cool thing, annotations, Cucumber lets you kind of flag tests on and off. You can say, don't run this on IE because we know it's gonna not work, or sometimes the web drivers have their own issues, so you wanna flag that. So on our team, who writes tests? Uh, so on our team, we, because we just kind of got it started when the immediate need came up, we all kind of did our part to set up the system and write our own tests. So everyone on our team writes, writes these uh, tests alongside their features 
or oftentimes after the feature is done because there's a bit of thrashing sometimes when you're writing a feature like that. Uh, and that's actually worked out pretty well. Although I haven't worked somewhere previously where there is there are dedicated um, test test automation to engineers. I've heard that's very nice and saved some of the pain that we've also gone through. So mad respect to our uh, friends in test automation. They they do some awesome work. So uh, who or what what actually runs a test? Well, we run the test when you're developing a test, but then uh, when do you actually run it? So in 2015, uh, we had one pipeline of tests. So there was actually a server sitting there and saying, oh, to get update, cool, uh, let's run a build, uh, spit out a bunch of output on HipChat. So we'd be sitting in a HipChat room uh, and watching the output come through. Now we're on Slack. But no longer do we only run it through that one machine sitting there when get updates. Because also the thing is our tests, if your tests take a while, you have a lot of people pushing code in, then it's going to get backed up in your tests. Uh, you won't find out about what broke until later. Now what we got going on is tests, UI tests, actual cross-browser tests for every single commit. Uh, so now this is using uh, CircleCI. Uh, you basically just set up a little, a little file that says, here's how to build my project. And then the last step there, you say, run, my, run our tests against this version of the project. Uh, and then that gets running. Uh, it's, I, think, I think I'll, yeah, I'll talk a little bit more about how awesome that is, but I can't understate how much better it is to have your tests run for every single commit, every single feature that someone writes, versus building up these buckets of failures where it's like, oh, like eight failures, like, okay, and then you gotta figure out, like, you look at the big list of commits, who did what? It's very awesome having pull request tests. Uh, so what challenges did we end up facing? Uh, yes, and how did we address those challenges that I alluded to earlier? Uh, multiple browsers. We support a lot of browsers. Uh, what we use is that Selenium web driver uh, because it's kind of that got that lingua franca uh, sort of factor of being able to point to different browsers. Uh, we can point it at any given browser, and we don't actually have to set up machines to do that because we use uh, Sauce Labs, which is a basically a cloud provider of these uh, of these VMs with those browsers in them. So you literally say, just point your Selenium test in your configuration of the URL. You just say, point to Sauce Labs, give me this browser, and then your tests start running, and they, they deal with all the stuff behind the hood. Uh, there are ways of setting up your own cloud, but uh, it's nice to not have to maintain that, and they're always adding new browser support. So this is our browsers.json file. Uh, it has a list of the basically the different browsers we want to run against. So some of these are the, the Sauce Labs identifiers. You can say what what uh, operating system you want, you can say what uh, browser you want, and then when your tests are running, you can even see, they record a video of the test running, so if there's a failure, you can say, okay, well, what actually happened during that run? Uh, adds, adds a little nice ability to debug that. Now, how about testing new changes? So you're writing a new test, or you locally change something, uh, you know, a new feature that you know is gonna break a test. Uh, how do you test that? So if you're doing it locally, uh, what you can do is use Chrome driver, in our case, where, uh, where you point the test at a local browser and it'll actually pop the browser up in front of you and you'll see the robot like doing stuff, it's kind of fun. Uh, I'll show you a video of ours in a second. Uh, and then we use Sauce Connect, so if you want a remote browser to be hitting your local machine, it's just like an SSH tunneling tool that lets it hit your machine. Uh, it also has some fanciness, like it caches stuff on their end so that the requests are a little faster. It's not that back and forth uh, business going on. And pull requests, I love pull request tests. <laughs> this was like my holy grail. I'm so glad we now have it. I, just, I think I, we just got it in the last like month or so. Um, so now our, our UI tests also run on CircleCI uh, and will uh, tell you when, thing, when your stuff broke stuff and so you don't have to worry about those buckets of failures anymore. Uh, so how about drag and drop? Uh, the standard Selenium drag and drop didn't work for us, so we ended up using jQuery Simulate. Uh, it happened to work with our SVG-based uh, drag, dragging and dropping uh, editor. Visual responsive changes. That's the cool thing. So in, what was it, last year or the year before, I was doing a hackathon, actually with my, the, our oldest brother. We'd gone to a hackathon, and I was trying to think of a project idea uh, based on like, what is, what's a project that's, that would be really useful? What's a pain point at work and how can I fix that? And I was thinking we had just had some bugs where it's like a button went away or something and it's like, I don't even know how you're gonna 
or our button show a second button copy showed up, and I'm like, how do you even test for that? You have to like say, okay, there's going to be one button. It's going to look like like it's too many steps when you're writing those individual manual steps, and often looking looking into who broke what when and finding out finding that out later from you know users or you know the CEO is is not very fun. So I figured, hey, what if we just? I thought this was like a super unique idea. What if we just took a screenshot of the thing and then compared it with another screenshot of the new version? Turns out a lot of people have done that before, but <laughs> I thought it was cool at the time. In fact, there's even a tool we ended up finding during the hackathon, uh, I think it was called PDIF, uh, that let, basically lets you uh, over, uh, it'll kind of show you, uh, it'll detect what percentage of the pixels change and it'll kind of provide this cool view of like which, what changed in between the, the two things. So we set that up. It was still a pretty cool tool. You just literally put the URLs in and press run, and it was cool. But it turns out uh, it was really hard to do that <laughs> right. Uh, apparently, when you take screenshots, uh, things, things change that you wouldn't expect change, like sub-pixel shifting of stuff, and it depends on like the browser's operating system renderer, it's, it's uh, yeah, you see a lot of weird stuff. And also, you know, if you have a, something randomly changing on your page, you have to deal with that. Turns out, it's an actual thing, though. So <laughs> there's something called Apple Tools that we found after, and I was like, ugh, why don't you just tell me about that? Uh, so Apple Tools, they're, ba they're basically, they're doing just that, so they provide an API that lets you uh, compare the images and, and add ignore regions and everything like that. So actually, in our case, it was because we already had the Selenium test set up, and they basically plug on top of the Selenium web driver. Uh, we just have these new steps that say eyes.open, and then you can have a, we had a new cucumber uh, thing here, step here that says, I see no difference for this. And that's basically a tagged baseline, a tagged image to say, I see no different difference for the homepage. And then it says, cool, check the last version of the homepage. If, if it did break, then it'll, uh, throw up, it'll be upset. Uh, so here's an example of one of our features that was converted to an eyes feature. Uh, so we mark it as eyes to say basically make the stuff available to run that. And then I say when I open my eyes to test this thing, go to the thing, still click around, we're still using Selenium commands. And then at some point I say, and I see no difference for blank game screen. Uh, and so it takes a screenshot at that point and gets it ready for our review. Uh, the other thing is this is cool. Cucumber has this, this thing that is scenario outlines where you can basically write a table of URLs and stuff, and it'll run the same steps for, steps for all of them. So yes, ignoring regions. As I alluded to earlier, if you have random elements on your page, things often change on web pages pretty often, rotating screens, or in this case, a random assortment of Angry Birds tiles on the screen. Uh, what we can do is you, you basically draw you uh, click this button and draw, add an ignore region within which you want to ignore changes. Uh, so yeah, it, when there is a failure, when something changes, here's an example of a failure where uh, this button is showing up when it shouldn't be showing up. Uh, that was due to, uh, there's a version of this that has parameters and a version of it that doesn't have parameters. And uh, there was some inheritance mix up there that caused that issue, but we caught it before it broke the tool. This is, this is kind of the interface, and, and here's another example of a failure where uh, the step button showed up when it shouldn't show up. Uh, and that was present on a lot of different steps in that same test, so you can kind of tab between the different steps there. And uh, yeah. The other thing is they also, uh, when you use the phone uh, version of it, it'll show the, the top bar of the kind of the whole simulator and screenshot based on that. So what do these tests look like when they are running? We'll do a little bit of this speed run. We're doing it on time. So yeah, there, I, I just found this so cool. So there's a computer, this, this Selenium robot is sitting there learning how to code. So it's code that's writing, that's learning how to write code. I just think that's kind of cool. That's silly. Yeah, it's kind of fun watching your site get used very quickly. <laughs> cool. So, wasting time or not wasting time. We don't want to waste time. Time is valuable. We can do things with time. 
so one thing that sometimes will happen is uh, tests, if you write, you know, you write a couple tests, and then it's like, oh, two minutes, that's fine. Like, I can do a, a minute-long test. I can wait for that. And then, you know, your whole team's writing tests, and then more people are writing tests. Suddenly, your test suite is 60 to 90 minutes, which means you're not going to run it locally. Uh, you're not going to run it very often, and then those buckets of, of changes that you're going to have to figure out what broke what are going to be larger. So what we started doing was parallelizing our test runs at the te in the test runner. Um, so you can basically say, run this at parallelization 50, and it'll spin up 50 browsers all at once and be you know, telling them all what to do at the same time, all hitting your same server. Actually, oftentimes the bottleneck is the server, your local server, because it's getting hammered by like 100 different uh, VMs. So uh, in 2015, we got back down from 60 to 90 minutes, back down to 20 to 30 minutes, and we're still around there. Uh, oftentimes, when we're having like team retrospectives, and it's like, what sucks about being, you know, our on-call person or looking through the the failures? Oftentimes, uh, you know, people will question the premise: Why do we have tests? What if we just didn't have the tests? And sometimes it's hard to answer that, or like, or what if we just cut out Firefox or Safari? Like, come on, let's just run like one browser. Aren't those issues all going to be the same? We're using jQuery. It's gonna, it'll, it'll sort itself out. Uh, and then I'm always like racking my brain. I was like, I could have sworn there was some Firefox bug or something. So what we started doing was keeping a bugs tests caught wiki page that are kind of like, it's kind of like the trophy hall for uh, the bugs that you caught. And I'll share some of the items from here. The nice thing about being an open source project is I can show you everything. Uh, here's here's an a instance where a button went away. Here's an instance where the button got uh, taller randomly. Uh, here's an instance where this weird margin, uh, white margin, got added to the right of uh, the tool, which is like, that stuff used to happen all the time, and it's like, it's nice to get notified about that early. Uh, this was a funny one. Uh, so uh, over, there was some kind of like rejiggering of the whole, of like some of our top level styles, uh, and then overflow hidden ended up applying to uh, the, this text up here. So you, if you can see, the words are kind of getting cut off. Like, I don't even know if I, if I was just clicking through it, I might not even notice that, but we caught that one. Uh, here, there's a duplicate but, uh, button got duplicated. That's always a tough one to catch uh, without the visual stuff. Uh, and here's one where there's one tiny gray pixel. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how that happens. Well, we figured it out at some point. But yeah, it catches all the kind of little stuff. Here was a big one that I caught. Uh, so this was... Yeah, speaking of bugs that, bugs still do happen, especially when you're using SVG. Uh, yeah, get bbox when it's hidden, blows up. Uh, and here's one where Chrome 50 deprecated SVG element offset width, and it broke our little layout of that text. Caught that one. Uh, and here's my favorite bug ever. Let's look at this, look at these two slides and imagine you're, you're doing some QA, manual QA on your site. What's the difference between these two web pages? There is a scroll bar, but why? But why? <laughs> see that uh, See that text down there? Yeah, and see actually even above there, stuff's getting shifted down too. The line height changed everywhere. <laughs> the entire website's line height was changed during a routine refactoring of top level styles. Uh, so we caught that, and yeah, I'm pretty certain if we didn't have these tests in place, we would still have uh, that, that our website would just be slightly longer forever. <laughs> Who investigates failures? We have a dev of the day uh, when failures do come up to kind of triage the stuff. It's not pleasant to be the dev of the day. It wasn't, didn't used to be pleasant to be dev of the day. It's, it's slightly better now. Uh, so right when you're running in a big bucket and you have a bunch of failures, you have to figure out uh, what caused them. So... You're looking, you're looking at any random failure from anyone's code from that entire day, uh, and then you have to figure out who broke what, and then uh, make sure that they get their fix in before you do a production push or revert it. Uh, now that we have those pull request tests, you don't have to do that, because it just doesn't break. Because, <laughs> the yeah, so now, now that we're actually running in every single pull request, before you do the pull request, uh, you'll check that you have to merge it. What's next for us? Uh, we're going to get our test results, like add a little GitHub comment with the, the screenshot diff. I think that will be cool in your branch when it breaks. Uh, if you guys want to learn more about cross-browser responsive tests, um, Dave Hefner 
has a, a sweet uh, introduction to that. And you can see there, you just define different resolutions and browsers uh, to do that. What are some takeaways? Start small. Everybody tests. Don't have to do that. If you have someone to test, then maybe not everyone has to test. But it worked out pretty well for us. And periodically invest in speed ups so your tests don't get too long. I just want to thank all my team who worked on many pieces of this because we all kind of shared the burden on that. And of course, the folks at uh, the various providers that we worked with. Thank you. Ah, yes. And if you're interested in getting involved, code.org slash help on our GitHub repository. Let's have some Q&A with Turtle CSS here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to reveal my first uh, AIM screen name. Oh, In yeah. hindsight, I don't think it was a good one. <laughs> mine was pretty, I thought mine was pretty embarrassing, but now that I'm here, I feel like. Yeah, you got to bring it back, Turtle That's CSS, right. all yeah. the way. All right, so we did have one question. Um, some folks are saying they've used Selenium for testing before, and they find that as applications change, the tests become really fragile and difficult to maintain, and they frequently have to be fixed. Right. So how did you uh, avoid this at code.org? Yeah, so you, so that, 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 one, uh, that one tip, I think, that was having a separate, uh, like, a sep separate portions of your site that don't thrash as much is, is helpful. Um, and then I think also making it okay to break tests is, is making the workflow for breaking tests a little less painful. I think that, that made a big difference for us because, yeah, it's, it's when you find out about the test a day or a week later that it's extremely painful to like figure out who broke what and what you did to break it. So I think, I think that stuff mitigates the pain of, of uh, having tests that are somewhat more fragile. And I imagine when you decided to write tests, one of the tenets is that now that you're adopting this, everyone has to be writing it and everyone has to submit tests. So how did right. that become part of your culture and day-to-day -day at uh, yeah. code.org? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so I think the way we kind of started it out is, you know, a couple people, it, it, everyone's kind of like dipping their toe in the water. It's like it, there's a new project, a new file, like some new steps to try out to run tests locally. And they'll be like, oh, okay, maybe I'll like try running, you know, for this, my, my feature, maybe this thing broke, Often, like it, oftentimes if something breaks, a uh, team member will say, hey, like, uh, don't we have a test that covered that? Or what if we had a test that covered that? <laughs> they'll say, okay, I write a test that covers that. Uh, yeah, so it kind of like grew from there, and then it's like, you don't want your stuff to break, and then it, especially if you could have prevented it by writing a test, it's like, all right, I uh, probably should have written a test for that, so it kind of ends up being on the owner of that, uh, which works for our team, because I think we have kind of separate areas of ownership, like features, we all kind of own the whole, whole feature. That's great, wonderful, and then it's just kind of adopted its way through, and your bug yep. list keeps everyone That's right, on keeps point. you motivated, yep, the fun list of all the bugs you caught, Nice. I like that. All right. Well, thank you so much, Brian. Yeah, I really appreciate thanks so it. much.